walks in heaven, I can say that. But the poor thing has a very unfortunate life. Uh, you can look at a lot. Do a do a. It's good to. Am I, am I on? My mic's going on. Let's see. I'm not seeing you, right? Can you hear that? Okay. Um, pick a character out of the Bible. You just do it. No audio. You can't hear this. Now you can? Okay. Yeah, turn your mic on, Mike. I want to send your mom up there with a cane. Right, Mama? Send Mama Michael up there. She'll take care of him. Um, anyway, there are characters in the Bible that you study them for for knowledge, for understanding, for learning, do character studies of different people in the Bible. Pick David, for instance, and just do a study of his life. Uh, the, the good things that happened, um, yeah, we fixed it, dear. Uh, the good things that happened, the bad things that happened with David, you can look at Solomon and read about his life. You read, uh, read about his life in the Kings and the Chronicles and then read the Proverbs and then read Ecclesiastes. Let Solomon teach you about Solomon. Solomon will tell you the truth about Solomon. Solomon said, I had it all, lived it all, enjoyed it all, and it was all a waste. It was all vanity. Okay? Roy, I'd say Solomon drank more than you did. Okay? Okay? And um, he had more money for it. But he would say the same thing. It was all vanity. It was a waste. Um, going, to, going to Las Vegas, it got, me, it got me interested in Las Vegas. That the city as a, as a whole, how it operates, is all started with mob money, number one. But walking through those casinos and seeing all of those retired people, canes, walkers, wheelchairs, oxygen masks, cigarettes, free drinks, because you get free drinks if you're gambling. Somebody will come by and give you all the alcohol, because the more alcohol you're on, the more you'll sit there and try to win. And the machines are designed... I'm, kind of going off scale here, but the machines are designed to let you win just enough to take it back later. But to see them take all that hard-earned money that they worked for all their life and saved up and blow it on those machines, that's a character study in itself, okay? And that's what Solomon would tell you. I had all of that and it was a waste. It was vanity, vexation, it was no good, and I wouldn't do it again. And he recommends to all of us, don't do what I did. But then you take Lot. And Lot, even though God called him just, meaning that God justified him and forgave him of his sins, and we will see Lot in heaven, Lot is an example of how God will allow us to escape the vengeance that's coming into this world. But the Bible doesn't hide these people's sins. There's only one person that I can think of in the Bible where you're, you're going to be hard-pressed to find sin in their life, and that's Joseph. Not... Mary's husband Joseph, Joseph the son of Jacob. You'd be hard pressed to find sin in his life. Um, huh? I said, sin was 
Yeah. But anyway, the Bible doesn't, doesn't gloss over, nor wash over, nor try to hide the, the sins of even the righteous people in the Bible. And Lot is one of those people. He made bad choices in his life. Back in Genesis 13, when their herdsmen strove together, Lot chose the, and probably his wife helped him, chose the well-watered plains of Sodom. And he chooses to live in the plains next to Sodom. And then when we find him in Genesis 19, he is inside, living inside Sodom and being affected. The Bible says he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked inside Sodom. He was vexed with that. It had an effect on him and the decisions that he made. So we know in Genesis 19 that when the angels finally led Lot out of the city, we know his, life, his wife turned around, turned a pillar of salt. We talked about that. So now it's only Lot and his two daughters. And that's it. That's all that, were, that survived the destruction of four cities was three people, Lot and his two daughters. And they refused to go to Zoar because it's another city. And they said that, you know, we don't want to go in there because they'll, they'll be mean to us or whatever. They was afraid to go in there. Let's read it from the scriptures. Uh, Genesis chapter 19. Let's, let's go to prayer first. And then we'll get into scripture. Father, give us, uh, give us uh, clarity of thought. Give us understanding of your word, Father, as we study this tiny portion of scripture. This, this one little small detail out of the Bible. Help us to understand the ramifications of the bad decisions that were made by not just Lot, but his family. Help us to understand, God, that even though as Christians we can, we can be right in your sight as far as being saved is concerned, being justified freely by your grace, Father, help us to understand that we will still make bad, stupid decisions. Decisions that we will end up regretting. Decisions that will place its mark on our family for generations to come. God, help us to understand that. Give us learning and knowledge, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Verse 30 of Genesis 19. The Bible says, And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. So Lot's bad decision so far has been he chose Sodom. Then he chose to move inside Sodom. Then he tarried while the angels were begging him, we got to get you out of the city. His two son-in-laws, they chose to remain inside Sodom. They were destroyed. Um, they were, they were um, son-in-laws in the fact that they were betrothed to Lot's two virgin daughters. They were betrothed, but they were not, the marriage had not been consummated yet. So they were still called the son-in-laws of Lot, but their two daughters were still virgins. So the, the two son-in-laws, their decision... They were destroyed in, in Sodom. Lot's wife's decision to turn back and look at Sodom and be turned into a pillar of salt. His decision not to go into Zoar, I think, was a mistake. Had he gone into Zoar, he would have more than likely found decent husbands for his two daughters. But he decided to go away from the city and up into a mountain and in a cave by himself with his two daughters. So verse, uh, verse 30 again, that's what it says. For he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Verse 31. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old. There is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Now remember, these two daughters grew up in Sodom. 
Their morality was taught by the morality that they saw growing up inside Sodom. And I am 100% positive that this kind of immorality took place inside Sodom. It takes place in this country. And it's the immorality of incest. Verse 32, Come, let us make our father drink wine. We will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. I mean, he got hammered. Okay? Now, Verse 34, and I'm not commenting a lot on this to keep this sort of PG, G rated. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Now, I'm going to tell you a true story. Uh, when Lisa and I uh, were young in this church, there were, there were two ladies that came to this church. Very close friends. And the, the one lady was married and had a house and the other lady rented the basement of the house that was made into an apartment. Now I'm not going to mention any names of these people. They're, they're long gone. Uh, most of them are. But uh, the lady that rented the apartment downstairs um, she was these were older ladies I would say when Lisa and I were teenagers they were already upper 50s into their 60s and so on and when we when I became pastor of this church a few years after I became pastor um, the lady, um, I'll call her Tina, the lady that lived in the downstairs apartment ended up, she was very tomboyish. And um, so we, we called her Tommy, but that wasn't her real name. So Tommy ended up with colon cancer and um, they did an operation on her but they couldn't get all the cancer and she started dying of this cancer as time drew near to her death Lisa and I spent time over there with her basically like Roy did it's you're on death watch is what you're doing you're being with somebody while they die so they don't die alone Lisa and I would, would go over there and we sometimes she would be awake sometimes she would be asleep when she would be awake we would talk with her a little bit and she would talk to me I'd pray with her I knew she was right with the Lord and um, she's in heaven right now at one point bless her heart she was this, we were over there and she was just a, passed out and she woke up and she looked at me and she said Jesus is in this room right now I just saw him and I believed her I believed her she said I could not see his face but he was he was here and 
what I always figured was she knew the time was near. That she was going to she was going to leave this world. Her daughter came during this time. She was in her fifties by then. Had a husband, had children, and um, at one point, Tommy woke up from being passed out, and she she just woke up and she said. I want everybody to leave this room except my daughter. Okay? So we all left. And what Tommy had to tell her daughter was that her, her daughter was the product of Tommy's father. who committed incest with Tommy and she gave birth to this daughter she had to tell her that this this was a secret that Tommy kept all her life and um, I don't I don't have any knowledge of whether she was married before she started coming to church here I was young I, I don't know but she had she just felt like her daughter needed to know this dying confession is that your grandfather is your father at the time she seemed to take it rather well she told Lisa and I uh, what 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 Tommy had told her she was a nice lady nice lady decent lady her and her husband they had a good marriage had children everything seemed to be okay but she was the product of incest and not too long, I mean, it wasn't a day, I don't think, after she told her that, that she passed away. Um, that takes place all over this world. It goes on in America. It goes on in Europe. It goes on in Africa. It goes on in places around the world civilized nations uncivilized nations you would think that uncivilized nations that it would be there but you wouldn't think that in civilized nations like America and Europe and London and that it wouldn't take place but it does and here's what the scripture turned to Leviticus 18 now the law is eternal don't give me that nonsense well this was before the law so it wasn't wrong God's law is God's law God didn't just dream stuff up one day and said I'll make it this way Leviticus 18 verse 6 it's too small to read on the screen but I'm going to read all of this. These are things that God said are an abomination. They're wrong to do. None of you, none of you shall approach to any that is near kin of, to him to uncover their nakedness. Now the Bible means, means what it says in that. Do not uncover them. Do not uncover their nakedness and then there is an implication in this then don't go anywhere beyond that okay you understand what I'm saying the nakedness verse 7 he said I am the Lord verse 7 the nakedness or thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover she is thy mother thou shalt not uncover her nakedness the nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. 
It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister. The daughter of thy father. Or daughter of thy mother. Whether she be born at home or born abroad. Even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. Verse 10. The nakedness of thy son's daughter. Or thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness, thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Verse 12, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, she is thy father's near kinsman, kinswoman. Verse 13, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Verse 14, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Verse 16, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. Verse 18. Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. Verse 19. Also shalt thou not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Now, that last verse, is that last verse any more or less wicked than any of these other verses before it? No! It is exactly the same kind of wickedness. So, Stephen Anderson, don't give me this nonsense about how sodomites cannot be saved, cannot be converted. They're all going to burn in hell because they committed that sin. What about the man who looked upon the nakedness of somebody else? I mean, this is an exhaustive list. Name somebody in this list that doesn't exist. Did I say that right? Name somebody in this list that you can look at their nakedness. Thy wife. Thy husband. That's it. All of it is an abomination with God. And this country is full of that abomination. It is... See, I worked out in construction, John. I heard these guys talk and brag. I heard their stories about their exploits. It was sickening. Absolutely sickening what these guys did. 90% of it covered in the verses I just read right here. God said don't do it. It is an abomination. And he threw Molech in there. Now watch this. Watch, watch what happens. This Bible's right. Because he put, he threw in the name of another god. And Molech and Chemosh were about the same god. They're a type of Satan, they're a type of the Antichrist. They're like Baal. Okay? So watch this. Genesis 19. Uh-oh. Lost the wheel again. Genesis 19, verse 37. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. Moab means son of his father. How'd you like to carry that name around? 
Because that name in your life, you're growing up with a name that tells everybody who your daddy was. My daddy was my granddaddy, Moab. She called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the youngest, she also bare a son and called his name Ben-Ami. Ben always means son of. Ben-Yamin, Benjamin, means son of the right hand. The same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Ben-Ami is the father of the Ammonites. Ben-Ami means son of my people. Both were brought into this world by way of incest. Wasn't necessarily Lot's sin. He was drunk. They, they made him drunk. It was their sins. But the Moabites and the Ammonites eternally bore the reproach of the incest of these two daughters on these two nights. They were the constant enemies of God's people. Numbers 21. Verse 26. It's just a, I just sampled the Ammonites in the Bible and the Moabites. Numbers 21, verse 26. For Heshbon was the city of Sion, the king of the Amorites. We know Sion was a giant. We know it. And so was Ar. He was a pirate giant. Ar. See, if you guys had been listening, you would have laughed at that. Uh... For Heshbon was the city of Sion, the king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land out of his hand, even unto Arnon. Arnon is the city of Ar, the giant. Um, wherefore they that speak in Proverbs say, Come into Heshbon, let the city of Sion be built and pre prepared. Remember, Sion's a giant. For there is a fire gone out of Heshbon. A flame from the city of Sion. It has consumed Ar of Moab. Ar was a giant. Ar was a king of the giants among the Moabites. And of the lords of the high places of Arnon. Woe to thee, Moab! Thou art undone, O people of Chemosh. In other words, the Moabites' God was not Jehovah. It was a false god named Chemosh, which is similar to, what did I just say? Molech, which is mentioned all through the scriptures. Chemosh and Molech and Saturn are all similar gods. They worship the stars. He hath given his sons that escaped and his daughters into captivity into Sion, king of the Amorites. So here's what we've learned about the Moabites. The Moabites became ruled over by the giant kings. Ar was a giant. They served a antichrist, satanic god that from time to time required human sacrifices. This is the lot of Moab. This is how God has selected them for them to live and to carry on their lives. It would, I, I would love to find out who are the Moabites of the 21st century. Because they've got to be still around somewhere. Somebody's heritage comes from the Moabites. I don't know whose. Joshua 24, verse 9. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab. Balak, king of Moab. Arose and warred against Israel. And sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. This story, we could read this whole story. Don't have time. 
But this whole story, you remember the story of Balaam, how he was hired by uh, Balak, the king of the Moabites, to curse Israel, and God wouldn't let him. God would not let him curse Israel, even though uh, ba Balaam kept having his hand out, ready to receive the reward of his divination and his curse against Israel, God forced Balaam to say, you cannot curse those whom God hath blessed. Amen! Now, I, and I'm going to I'll, I'll just kind of go to the side a little bit here and say, in reality, witchcraft exists in reality. Don't think it doesn't. If you are saved, they cannot cast a spell on you. They cannot curse you. They cannot do it. It will not, it will not work if you are born again. Now, they can vex you, but they cannot curse you. Cursing is a you're going to hell word. You are blessed. Blessed means you're going to heaven word. Okay? So, and that's, that's what he said. That's what God made him say. Those whom God has blessed, you cannot curse. He was right. Judges 3.14 So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Because of Israel's wickedness, God made Israel serve in hard bondage the Moabites, the children of incest, for 18 years. Eglon was that fat king. And you remember who was it? Ehud, who had that big, he had that cubit long knife hidden in his thigh. And he went into king, the king of Eglon's room there and the guard, guard shut the door and he said, hey, I got king, I got a message for you. And the king said, shut the doors. They shut the doors and he got up to the old king and he stabbed him in the belly and the Bible says the dirt came out, which means his bowel contents. And it's kind of funny because then the Bible says the, the soldiers, after a few hours, and he, and he escaped out the window. And the Bible says after, you know, I, I, don't, I don't remember exactly how it puts it, but after a while, the soldiers are out there going, I wonder what the king's doing. And then they smell it. Yeah, I know what he's doing. Are, are you going to go in and check on him? I'm not going in to check on him. He's in there, got his feet covered. I'm not going in there. They were embarrassed and ashamed to go in there because they figured he was sitting on the pot. Because they smelled that, what come out of him. Finally, they opened the door and there he was dead with all his guts hanging out. Yeah. I think some of those stories are funny to me. I can see those two soldiers standing out that door going, what's he doing in there? Ooh. No, leave him in there. Ooh. Holy cow. Mm. So, some of that stuff's just funny. Amen. Uh, Ruth! Ruth! I love this now. Listen. There's redemption for everybody. Even the children of incest. Even the children of incest. Because that's who Ruth was. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1. And it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah... Bethlehem Judah, hmm. Who was born in Bethlehem Judah? Hmm, think about it, hmm. There it was, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Lot's incest children. He, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons, 
And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah. That is where Oprah Winfrey got her name. Yeah, it is. Her mom gave her the name Oprah because that's what she thought it was. She read it, she read it in the Bible as Oprah, but it's really Orpah. And that's where she got her name from. The one was Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the women was left of her two sons and her husband. Ruth, now watch this. Ruth goes through in the book of Ruth and marries the kinsman redeemer and gives birth to the child who ends up being a father of David. Who ends up being a father of Jesus God can even take a Moabitess, a child of incest, a child of a cursed nation, and redeem them. Don't ever think that you and your family are too bad and too wicked to be saved. Don't. All you folks online, don't ever think that God took a Moabite Gentile bride think about it that's us Gary we're the Gentile bride God took a Gentile bride married a near kinsman to redeem the inheritance of Elimelech to raise up seed unto Elimelech because the two sons are dead and when she gives birth to the child what was his name? huh? Obed when she gives birth to Obed she hands him over to Naomi and said Here, here's your baby this, this is your baby and Naomi raised Obed and Obed, you can count, boom, 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 from, it gives you a list from Perez all the way down to David. It's ten generations, I think. Ten's the number for dominion. Okay? Some, you, I know you guys are looking that up, but anyway. Second Chronicles 20, verse 1, it came to pass after this also. All, turn, turn to Second Chronicles. Turn to Second Chronicles, one of my favorite stories, first sermon I ever, well, not first sermon, second sermon I ever preached, I think, was this one, Second Chronicles. I loved this story. I loved it. Thought it was one of the best stories in the whole Bible. I've read others since then, and I think they're all the best stories in the whole Bible, because they are. All of them are the best. But Second Chronicles, chapter 20 came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon notice this now Ammon is Ben Ami child of incest Moab is the first daughter's son of incest so Moab and Ammon and it says with them other beside the Ammonites it doesn't say it here but it says it uh, down in verse 10, I believe. You find out that it's the Edomites. Esau. They're from Mount Seir. Mount Seir is Edom. It is Esau. It is everybody who hates Israel. Amen. The Moabites, the Ammonites hate Israel. And the Esauites hate Jacob. Hate them. And then there, there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side, Syria. And behold, they be in Hazazon Tamar, which is in En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared. This is you getting saved. Because you heard that hell and judgment was coming. And you were afraid that you were going to die and go to hell. 
If you were not afraid of dying and going to hell, I would check your salvation. When I got saved, I was afraid of dying and going to hell. I'm still afraid of dying and going to hell. Amen. It's a healthy fear. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Why? Because they realized they could not beat this army by themselves. When you realize you cannot beat your addictions, you cannot beat your sins, you cannot beat lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. There's three armies here. Moab, Ammon, and Edom. And all three are coming to take you to hell. And you realize, I can't stop sinning. That's when you seek help from God. Amen! Amen. Now, if you're still enjoying your sin, you're not going to ask help from God. You're enjoying it too much. I witnessed to a guy one time years ago when I was a teenager out in a parking lot where, what's that tool place over here now? Where Kmart used to be. Harbor Freight used to be Venture years ago. He come out of Venture and we was witnessing me and I don't remember who it was from this church. And he said, guys, I know everything you're saying is right. But he said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, I got a party I'm going to Friday. And he said, I'm bound and determined to go to that party. If I got saved tonight, I'd feel like a hypocrite going to that party tomorrow. And he walked away from the gospel of Jesus Christ to go to that party the next night. We never saw him. I don't know what, what happened to him. I hope he, eventually he got saved. But he turned it down because he knew that he wanted to go to that party first. Then get right with God. Maybe get right with God. I don't know. But he real Joshua realized he could not he could not stand up against them. In verse six, and said, "O Lord God of our fathers, art thou not God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdom of, of, the, of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art, art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave us it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever?" And they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. That was from the prayer that Solomon prayed when he dedicated the temple. He said, God... If we stand before this house and beg of you to come and aid us and help us and protect us, will you come and help and save your people? Solomon prayed that when he dedicated the temple. And Jehoshaphat knew that. He read, he read his Bible. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have, and I'm going to tell you something, I am, I am praying this, Michael and Mama Michael, I am praying this against those cattle wrestlers who stole all that cattle and burnt those houses down in that village in Turkana. I am angry at them. I would, I would hire an army to go after him. That makes me angry. Those people in Turkana, God gave those people to this church to love them and to care for them and to stand up for them. Do you not realize that? That is a big responsibility for a little church, is it not? But God gave that to us. God gave those people to us. To care for them. To pray for them. To stand up for them. 
to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ so they could be saved. God gave them to us. And I'm saying, oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against that great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. So no, I'm not going to hire a militia. I'm going to let God deal with them. And I want to tell you something. I know God. When God gets in a killing mood, He does it big, doesn't He? When the ground opened up and swallowed Kohath, and 250 people along with him and his family and all the people that stood with him, Gary, and all the Israelites saw that. God did it big, didn't he? I mean, the earth didn't just crack open like that. It opened up a big hole and swallowed them up whole. Boom. There was a guy in Florida years ago, I remember, and I talked about it on PMO once, several year, years ago, a sinkhole opened up underneath his house, directly underneath the chair that he sat in every day. And that hole opened up the one day while he's sitting in his chair, the ground opened up underneath his house and swallowed him up whole and killed him. And I'm going... I wonder what he did. Verse 16. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. And you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight. Listen to this. Can you hang on the cross for, for your sins or anybody else's sins? You know what Kenneth Copeland said? Kenneth Copeland said that God told him that he could. He did. It's, it, I got a recording of it. It's on the internet. He said, a twice-born man hung on the cross. And Kenneth Copeland said, you mean to say that I could hang on the cross like Jesus did because now I'm twice born? And God said, that's exactly right. That man is evil. He is hellish, devilish, satanic, his eyes are full of adultery and evil and lust. Whew. O Jude and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed, for tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Joshua bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Jude and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up and to praise the Lord of God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Oh, I love this. I want to skip down. Verse 22, when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, for they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they made them an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. I love this! And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. Listen, when God forgives all of your sins, none of them escape. Hallelujah! None of them get, none of them run, get run away. He catches them all and forgives them all and covers them all. Somebody say amen. Boy, I like this. Amen. The battle is not yours, but God's. That's it. It's five four o'clock. Get out of here. Five after. Stud, study, study your Bible. You'll get stuff like this and you'll weep. 
you'll get happy. God will give you understanding and you'll, you'll start crying. I mean, you will start crying. You start reading your Bible and get, and get stuff like this out of it. It'll help you. Like it's helped me. Father, bless your word. It's a good word. Father, I, I'm addicted to this book. I love this book. I thank you, God, for this book. Lord, bless, bless your word. Just, just a little study of these Moabites and Ammonites and who they are and how you use them for your glory and your honor's sake and your kingdom's sake. God, you raised them up. Some of them you raised up to be enemies. Some of them you raised up, Father, to redeem them. Just like you did Ruth. Put her in the lineage of Jesus Christ. What a story that is. A child of incest being one of the grandmothers of Jesus Christ. What a blessed story. Father, you do things like that every day in people's lives. You save people in the worst gutter possible and save them to the highest place. You are a good God like that, and I love you for that. Thank you, God, for saving the people that I love who were so wicked, and you saved them. Thank you, God, for showing us these wonderful things tonight. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.